Hello, and we're live with JavaScript Air. Um, my name is Kenzie Dodds, and I'm your host. And today we're going to be talking about Babel, the JavaScript compiler transpiler thing. Um, and so before we get started into our show, and I, uh, before I introduce everybody, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Egghead.io is our premier sponsor, and they have a huge library of bite-sized web development training videos, like five-minute videos. Uh, you can check them out for content on JavaScript and Node and Angular and React and all kinds of stuff. Um, then there's Frontend Masters. They're also a training site, and um, they're a recorded expert-led workshop uh, with courses on advanced JavaScript, asynchronous functional JavaScript, as well as lots of other awesome courses about front-end topics. Uh, I recommend you check them out. You have a lot to learn there. TrackJS reports bugs in your JavaScript before your customers notice them, and with their telemet tele I can't ever say this word properly, telemetry <laughs> timeline, um, you'll have the contacts to actually fix the bugs that, uh, that it reports to you. So check them out and start tracking your uh, JavaScript errors today at trackjs.com. Awesome. And so for, uh, for anybody who's watching live, you can uh, tweet with the hashtag JSAirQuestion, uh, and then you can, uh, at the end of the show, we'll answer any questions that you have uh, with that hashtag. And if you just want to tweet about the show in general, the hashtag is JavaScript Air. And uh, remember, uh, we're a weekly show, and so next week we're going to have a show called Functional and Immutable Design Patterns in JavaScript. Um, and we'll have Dan Abramoff and Brian Lunsdorf to talk about uh, functional programming. JavaScript is going to be sweet. Um, and as always, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and Facebook to keep up to date with the latest and greatest. Awesome. So let's go ahead and introduce everybody. Um, we have Kyle Simpson. And Pam Sell. Sully. Sully. Oh my goodness. Is that is that right? You've said it right before, Ken. It's okay. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. Well, it's Sully. Uh, wow. Okay. And uh, I'm your host, Kenzie Dodds. And then we have a couple awesome guests for us uh, today. Henry Zhu. Hey there. And Amjad Massad. Hey. And Logan Smith. Hi. And uh, that's Smith with a Y, if you're curious, um, which I think is actually kind of cool. Um, so let's go ahead and get to know our guests a little bit really quick. Uh, Henry, do you want to give us an intro um, to yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm Henry. Um, I'm HZOO on GitHub. Um, I work at Behance, which is part of Adobe, uh, doing JavaScript. Uh, I got started in open source about a year ago. I uh, started contributing to JSCS, which is a style checker. Um, similar to JS Hay and ESLint, uh, learned a lot about ASTs, and that's what led me to work on Babel. So yeah, cool. Thank you for your work, um, Amja. What do you have for, or could you introduce yourself for us? Yeah, um, I work at Facebook. I work on the JavaScript uh, infrastructure team, and we um, we maintain the core tools and, and uh, things. Uh, pertaining to, to the JavaScript language. So um, I work a lot in Babel, and I uh, end up also contributing to that. Um, and yeah, that's it. Cool, thanks. And Logan? Yeah, um, so honestly, I, uh, I work at a company called Inkling, um, and we, do, we have a cloud publishing platform for companies to uh, basically make documents and distribute them uh, to specific groups of people. Um, Beyond that, uh, I've been working on Babel kind of in my free time since uh, about February of last year, and I kind of got into it when we were transitioning our, some of our own code bases to Webpack, uh, which I remember talking to you, Kent, way back on the Webpack uh, Gitter room, and uh, then I kind of transitioned in there to uh, kind of helping out and doing support for Babel. Cool, yeah, that's exactly how I got into it, too. Uh, way back in January, when it was still 6 to 5. Um, <laughs> So also, uh, if, if you're not watching and you're listening, just know that Logan has the Christmas spirit alive in his home. Uh, I like the Christmas uh, tree there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so sweet. Let's uh, just as a good kickoff question for our conversation today, um, let's give a quick intro to what Babel is and kind of a, a history of uh, the Babel transpiler. Anybody want to take that? <laughs> I guess I can. I don't know. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, Babel is uh, 
an application for basically taking any kind of input JavaScript source code and transforming it, running some subset of transformations on it. Um, and it comes with kind of a standard set to uh, convert, for instance, uh, ECMAScript 6 code into ECMAScript 5 or ECMAScript 3 uh, to support older browsers and still allow you to use kind of more advanced functionality uh, in the web today. So. Yeah. And uh, history-wise, I guess it started about a year ago, um, and Sebastian started it and kind of took off pretty much immediately, and then uh, kind of the rest of us have kind of come on slowly over that time. So Sebastian and uh, came on, and then we have James, Kyle, and then uh, kind of the rest of us have kind of joined on since then. I, cool. Yeah, I think about it as a, a compiler tool chain. If you're if you're familiar with uh, uh, kind of LLVM or any of the other compiler tool chains, they they you know ship with a bunch of tools that help you to build uh, compilers. So I think uh, that's what what um what Babel is is uh, it's a it's basically like a Lego. There's like building blocks of of different packages that you can use to string together your you know uh, your favorite type of uh, JavaScript that that you want to build. So um, and that also means that you can build uh, tools on top of it. So you can build. Um, uh, it, there hasn't been examples of that, but I think we're going to start seeing more examples of that. Um, in addition to the compilers, uh, I think you'd be able to build uh, a linter. You'd be able. Well, Babel sort of backs currently uh, ESLint through Babel ESLint, but you'll be able to build um, all sorts of uh, tools that that w want to be able to parse the code and 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 do some kind of uh, logic uh, on the code. Cool. So um, I, I'm kind of curious. I, so people who don't know the history of, um, of Babel or the recent history, um, Babel recently moved from transpiler only from like ESNext to the current version of, of JavaScript or the ECMAScript standard. Uh, they moved from that to more of a general uh, tooling platform. So can you talk about how and why that, that decision was made um, to kind of distance itself, well, not distance itself, but like change from just being a transpiler to a JavaScript tooling platform? Yeah, actually, oh, you can go. No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I guess that decision was like kind of, um, it, it was a while actually, it was like February, so we, I think um, a lot of times the tools that we use uh, rely on like a parser and if we're going to have to re-implement everything in ES6, then you have to wait on all those tools to get um, updated. And so if Babel becomes more of like a platform that people can use, then anytime Babel gets updated, uh, other tools can just use that instead of re-implementing uh, some new features, stuff like that. Um, I don't know if you want to go more yeah. on um, Yeah, I think that's... That's mainly it. I, I think there are a few other reasons. Um, uh, I think talking to Sebastian, he mentioned also that um, he kind of got tired of, of uh, bumping the major version every every few months because you know you had to do a breaking change because of the language, and um, and if you're a transpiler, you kind of have to do that anytime the spec change, anytime you want to add a new feature. But if you want to build a platform, then uh, you'll be able to maintain these uh, packages separately, and you don't have to uh, kind of like do these, uh, you know, major uh, version bumps, uh, you know, every every couple of months. Um, um, and yeah, I, I think what Henry mentioned with regards to the to the t tooling is a is a great point. Um, I think a lot of people in the community found uh, great value in using. Babel not just as a as a transpiler but as a parser um, as a AST uh, visitor and uh, all these things and kind of naturally evolved to this thing that that is more of a tool chain than just a transpiler I have a I actually have a question on that particular point so I think there's been some confusion in the wake of the Babel 6 release about what the strategy or the intended strategy I guess um, best practice, maybe is the best way to say it, for uh, working with features that are not yet fully standardized, um, oftentimes referred to as the stage zero or maybe stage one. 
And I think that strategy shifted a bit with the release of Babel 6, but maybe I think I, I've seen some people have some confusion around that. So can you speak specifically to what changes were made there and what we're supposed to be doing with respect to non-standard features? Um, let's see. Do you want to clarify what you mean by, by like, how to use them or what you mean by that exactly? Uh, yeah, so specifically, I think some of the confusion has been around um, if I implement uh, a stage zero, f uh, I start using a stage zero feature in my application in a particular way, and then the spec changes and that feature changes, and but the platform now allows me to continue to use the old implementation of that feature basically forever. There's no like requirement that I to to stay up to date with the rest of the stuff. There's no requirement that I update that thing, which I think some perhaps at least my worry is that that will tempt people into basically getting locked into an old version of a feature and staying there perhaps forever. So I'm just curious about how that plays. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I think uh, more recently um, the we've been more careful in kind of uh, merging things that are stage zero or, or even pre-stage zero. I think there was a really cool plugin yeah. recently for the pipeline operator. And it's like, you know, part of me won that and want to play with it. But um, I think, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the move to Babel 6 and kind of like try to build a st uh, stable platform. Uh, we have to say no to a lot of these things. Um, uh, I, it's unfortunate that Sebastian is not uh, with us to kind of like give the official stance of, of Babel on this because um, I can't really speak entirely to that, but um, my understanding is that we can, um, w we want people to upgrade whenever there's a, there's a change in the spec. We'll upgrade the compiler and we'll encourage people to upgrade. Uh, the way we've handled that at Facebook and we, we've kind of trying to um, to also teach the community about that is using code mods. Um, and it, when you have the ability to code mod code, you'll be able to aggressively adopt features, but whenever these features change, um, w you'll be able to code mod these tools. And so for, for, the benefit, for the benefit yeah. of our audience, can you explain for everyone what a code mod is? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so code mod is um, given um, uh, a, 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 an AC pattern uh, you want to transform it to another ASC pattern. So it, it's kind of like when you uh, when you use Babel to transform ES6 to ES5, but in this case, it doesn't have to be compiling to a to a lower level of the language. It's more like from one language, from one syntax or one language features to another. So a good example is, um, or, or you can do it in reverse even. A good example is if you have a... Oh, no, hey. <laughs> If you have oh, a lot of snap. <laughs> <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so for, for our audience not watching and listening, Sebastian just joined us. I we invoked him and he came out of the ether. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I have no idea where you're up to. I was watching the live stream, which I think is like delayed a lot. Uh, well, welcome to the show, Sebastian. <laughs> I'm glad you were you were uh, talking. Uh, did, did you want to finish your thought? Yeah. So code mods. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, anonymous functions and you kind of want to be consistent across the code base, you can transform anonymous functions to um, uh, to arrow to arrow functions, and in, in, in some cases. Um, so this is an example of a code mod. So um, we try to whenever we adopt a feature. So we adopted classes really early on. And we ended up, uh, you know, being uh, using an early version of the spec. When we, when the time came to upgrade to Babel, we had to do a lot of code mods in order to upgrade our class um, syntax to the new, to the new class spec. So just, just to, for a, a further point of clarification here, a code mod, if I understand you correctly, is a one-time transformation done to the code to pull it from one version of the spec, say, to an updated version. It's not the same thing as the Babel transpilation, which is kind of an ongoing thing. This is a one-time move you from the old to the new sort of thing. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a great way to put it. And it's like automated rather than you manually doing everything one by one. Yeah, I actually experienced a... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. 
<laughs> I said, and it's, and it's much easier than doing like a find replace on your code base or trying to set in a bunch of files or something, which is pretty much yeah, impossible. I, I totally, I totally just spent totally just spent like two hours doing a find and replace yesterday where I totally should have written the code mod. But sometimes it feels like it would be easier, but I just need to do it. <laughs> yeah, we can put it in the uh, show notes, but there's a tool that uh, uh, we built internally uh, by. Uh, by my coworker Felix, uh, it's called JS CodeShift, and it's a really nice tool. It, like it gives you like a jQuery like API for like managing ASTs, which I think is pretty sweet. Cool. So, so the idea then, if just to circle us back to what my line of questioning was about, and Sebastian, you probably have some thoughts on this too, but my line of questioning was basically, uh, wh why or what is it that we're supposed to be doing with the new Babel 6 release that might be different than how we used to manage working with a feature that maybe isn't fully standardized yet and might change and should we be locking ourselves into older versions of it or updating and Ahmad suggested that we the code mods are a way to keep yourself up to date but I'm still kinda curious um, since the platform doesn't require you to do so uh, what do you think in terms of whether or not people will or if they'll stay stuck on an older version, for example? Um, <clears throat> what's this in like, regards to specifically? Like, do you have a specific example? Uh, well, there have been several changes to some of the Stage 0 features, so I'm not calling one out in particular, but I know that Stage 0 features do tend to evolve over time. Like and decorators. I, I think that, what's that? Uh, like decorators. Uh, I'm basically, yeah, so basically I'm just suggesting if that has happened now or if it happens in the future, what is the way that normal developers, ones that, you know, aren't in the, all the RSC chats and things, how do they know what they're supposed to be doing should, and, and being encouraged to upgrade? So is this, like, about what's the incentive to, like, upgrade to a new proposal if you can just continue using, like... I yes. guess it's what is the official position if Babel had to introduce like a breaking change, essentially, right? Um, so right now, like plugins, uh, Babel, everything on Babel kind of operates on one version line. So any breaking changes would have to kind of be um, either everything would have to be bumped or would have to introduce having separate plugins be versioned like independently relative to the major version. Um, so I guess like in the future, if that were ever an issue, like if there was a breaking change to um, one of the transforms we could was like bump the major for that particular plugin, um, or we can just like introduce a completely new plugin. Um, I like I guess the I don't see it as like a bad thing. Like there's this like a breaking change to a feature, and you're like using the old version of it, then like there's no like immediate problem for that. Um, besides just potentially being annoying in the future to deal with. But I guess that's kind of like when you're adopting extremely early stuff that has little chance of, like, actually becoming standardized or, um, like, will never become standardized, and that's kind of, like, a risk that you're taking on. So I guess, like, it's not, like, something that will sneak up on you. It's kind of a thing that will probably happen, and you kind of have to be aware of that. So I guess the where I was headed with this question was actually the bigger one, which is do you view, do you view the platform as something that can I mean, it definitely can, but should it be enabling developers to basically do their own experiments completely outside of TC39, come up with their own invented syntaxes, for example, build plugins for them, and perhaps start to fragment out. I mean, if a community built themselves around a whole new syntax and that wasn't on any standards track and wasn't going to be, um, is there splintering concerns there? It, should the platform do anything to help shepherd that back to the standard, or are we totally agnostic of that? Um, Babel has not and will not implement anything that isn't on standards track. Um, like, yeah, that that's more or less. Like, you can't arbitrarily add um, new syntax. I guess there is one exception where it's um, there's plugins for JSX and Flow. Um, they aren't enabled by default, like, at all, so you have to be very explicit about opting into those. And those are something that um, them not being a standard is, like, at the forefront of them projects. That's kind of like why that syntax exists. That's why it's not being actively proposed. So I think it's fairly safe to use those since they, they kind of have a different development cycle outside of the actual language. Um, 
but you can't, like, somebody, if you wanted to add some syntax to Babel, uh, you would actually have to add it to the core parser. You can't, like, there's no support for parse plugins. So I don't think, yeah. So being fearful of somebody adding some new syntax and it suddenly becoming popular is, like, technically not possible currently. Um, uh, I, I think also Kyle's question is, like, uh, maybe they, they use Babel to build their own syntax and, and they have their own in-house uh, syntax and I think we're yeah we're pretty agnostic about that I think we provided tools for people to do that I mean you never know where the next innovation in JavaScript is gonna come from I think everybody in the community know like a lot of people in the community really like JSX and we kind of like uh, it kind of evolved uh, from Facebook's experience so we're not gonna say we're not gonna be um, uh, elitist about this and say we're the only one or even TC39 is the only one that will come up with all the Really awesome syntax, but you know it's it's a really high bar. And if you if you want to go and innovate in this thing, you may end up in your own corner of the world, uh, and like you will not have a lot of support of people. W one thing that comes to mind, I think, like the media community, like um, that uh, implemented fibers, for example, and that was an interesting you know experimentation. But I think now they're coming around. They're gonna like. Um, change things to async away and, and generators, although I'm not entirely sure, but that's another, that's uh, an example of of a company or a project that took a different route, but then they, they route it back. You know, they, there are failures and there are successes in this domain, but uh, I think we're pretty agnostic about that. So that, my, my point I think actually could be made with a thought experiment around JSX. Um, so, as you say, a lot of people are super excited about JSX, and it has definitely grown in support. Um, it, got an, it got an early boost by being added to Babel back in, I forget, I guess it was version 5, but it got a, an early boost with that. That certainly helped things a lot, I would say. But if Babel as it exists today, with your mindset of we don't add non-standard stuff, or if we do, the bar is super high, if that had been true, before JSX was invented, could someone really have actually used the Babel platform to do that? And if that's a yes or no question, I think there's trade-offs on either side. So that's really what I'm getting at is how do we balance uh, staying on a standards track with allowing people to experiment? As in how we allow people to experiment with the language itself? Yeah, I mean, th with my spot thought experiment to run JSX, could JSX be invented today and built on the Babel platform, would it have still been able to gain the momentum that it needed, given that you're saying there's this really hard, high bar, which is that we don't allow compiler plugins. So you can't actually invent whole new syntax. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, so JSX was, um, I, I'm not sure if this is what you explicitly said, but um, JSX support was basically in a previous Facebook compiler um, called JS Transform. So basically, and JS Transform has been around for years, and so that's kind of like saying that JSX was as, was like coupled to Babel. I think it's kind of a bit disingenuous since it was um, at the point when Babel act, or 6.5 actually added JSX. Um, JS Transform was like predominantly what the React community actually used for J, uh, to compile JSX. Now it's kind of Babel, um, but currently, yeah, I I guess like it is harder for people to experiment and innovate on their own things. Um, but it just comes to like the reason that parser plugins actually haven't been added to Babel isn't really like a philosophical question. It's more like a question of ideology. It's more about like technically how does that work? Um, having like a pluggable parser is like actually kind of like a fairly large field of like research. People like write their PhDs on how like do you architect having a pluggable parser. Um, so this isn't like a trivial thing. Um, there's like ways that you can kind of simply do it, but there's like a whole lot of hidden gotchas. So the barrier to actually doing that is like purely technical. Um, so if anybody has any suggestions on how to do that, then. Yeah, I would also add the, that the, um, um, you mentioned in your question that, you know, JSX got a boost from being in Babel. I think it's more the other way around. I think Babel got a boost but because it was it was the official compiler for React. And, um, and 
the fact that it was in Babel did not get the community to adopt it. The, the adoption was already happening before it was before it was uh, before Babel was uh, was a thing actually. So I actually had kind of a technical question about this. Um, like when there are proposals like the pipe operator, for example, um, that's like totally a new syntax. How how do you get that added to the Babel parser? Like how how do you make a plugin to um, you know where Babel uh, to make Babel be able to parse that and and actually use that new functionality. How does that happen? So uh, at the moment, that's not something that you can directly achieve with the with Babel. I guess like adding some flexibility to the parser isn't really something that we support. And so like to actually do that and experiment with that, you'd have to essentially uh, make a clone of the Babel repo entirely yourself, and then essentially have a local development environment of Babel that you've changed to support that functionality. Uh, and that's essentially what happened with the pipe operator that someone was working on. I see. OK, so if it's new, like, because lots of plugins basically just move things around, or they'll like add some code here or whatever. Um, so if it's, if it's something that's new to as uh, syntax-wise, then it needs to, uh, there, there's a change in the parser that needs to happen for that to be enabled. Is that right? Yeah, essentially. Uh, and that's, that's part of what Sebastian has said around it just being a very difficult thing to get right. Uh, and I think in, in Babel 5, you could kind of screw around with the parser a little bit, but it just it wasn't, some, you know, it's not an API that you'd want to make public. It's like, then you have to support it and actually make it work well. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> I guess I would just observe that you as a team managing the project do actually have to navigate that because there's always going to be new syntax proposed. So managing that internally must be difficult. And probably if you were able to achieve, as Sebastian said, you know, this really difficult thing of a pluggable parser, that would probably make your lives easier as well as others who would like to experiment as well. Good luck, guys. <laughs> No problem. Cool. So I actually had a question about managing this project. Um, so if anybody's been to the Babel repo on GitHub, you'll see it's um, what has been termed as a mono repo. So there's um, all like tons of the uh, Babel plugins, like the official Babel plugins, live in the Babel repo. And I wanted to um, ask about like what what was the um, the reasoning behind that uh, that decision, having multiple uh, NPM modules in a single repo, as well as uh, also moving to Fabricator rather than GitHub issues. Uh, what kind of drove that? Because I think we have some listeners who would be interested to know how other projects man are, are managed. I guess for me, it's kind of interesting. As far as the mono repo goes, it it's really useful because it offers you know people one place to go look, which I think can be cute. Nice, like a really nice benefit. If you have, Babel has so many sub modules that it can be, I I would think, really hard for people to know where to look and know where to begin when approaching the code base. So I would hope that having a single location for that would help a lot. Um, I think it also just helps us keep everything kind of centralized and not split across just tons and tons of GitHub projects. Um, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> that was kind of like the major reason. Um, I guess Babel 6 kind of like took things to a whole new level in terms of like modularity, having things in all separate modules. And having those across a whole bunch of repos is like really, um, it's like difficult for the development environment, uh, difficult to test and difficult to iterate upon. Um, I know like this is, I've heard this for like some of the contributors to Browserify, how Browserify is like split up a whole bunch, a whole bunch of different repos. It's kind of difficult to make one change. You have to like npm link everything and run the tests individually, and you have to make sure that everything's set up correctly. Whereas in if you just have everything in the same repo, it's got the exact same kind of like test runner for everything. Um, it makes integration tests much easier. Um, and also, yeah, it, it doesn't mean to have like one build system, one way of linting. Uh, if somebody has an issue or a pull request, um, they just send it and they can update all the different modules. Otherwise, like synchronizing kind of pull requests across different repos isn't like really like a first class thing. With GitHub you can kind of um, like merge them all at the same time and then you have to make sure that when you publish them they've all got the exact same versions if they rely on certain functionality. 
and then you just like go down this massive rabbit hole where you're de- like this problem kind of exists even when you just have like a handful of modules. But kind of this is like when you extrapolate it out to like I think it's Babel, I don't know, I think it's like 130 modules or something. It, it like it's a really really big issue since if you want to contribute, you kind of have to clone everything. You're not quite sure. Potentially, you might be working on something and then realize, oh, hey, it actually uses this module, and you have to go clone that, and then you have to like build it, and then you have to test it, and then you have to make sure it's linked properly to the module that you're previously testing. Um, so there's like a whole lot of advantages having the mono repo. Yeah, I just like there's 120 modules. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> that is so amazing. Holy cow! Uh, this is such a like it's a much bigger project than I. Um, I knew it was a big project, but it's much bigger than I expected. Like, how many, uh, I, I guess I could just look, but how many contributors do you have? Like, do you have a ton of contributors who are building this thing? Because that's got to be, like, a ton of code. How does that uh, management of that piece work? Uh, until very recently, I think it was mostly Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and we just, uh, at least for me, I, I recently started seriously contributing to the project. I think it was also Sebastian, sorry, I, um, uh, and, and Kyle, um, and, uh, sorry, James Kyle, um, and uh, until uh, recently, um, it was also harder for contributors to, to jump in and kind of start contributing because, you know, everything was in Sebastian's mind. But I think uh, we have uh, more documentation now the tools are really easy to use. Um, because it's a mono repo, there's, there's some challenges uh, to how to manage the project, but um, uh, it's more streamlined how to, you know, how to, uh, you know, uh, change a plugin and how to publish a release and things like that. Yeah, I would also say that part of that was that if there were bugs uh, until reasonably recently, Sebastian would have them fixed before you had time to read the bug. So, <laughs> well, thanks for all your work, Sebastian. <laughs> That's awesome. It's really amazing. Um, so I I wanted to ask a little bit. Uh, I know that I I should have looked at the stats before, but I imagine there are still a lot of people using Babel five. Um, because the upgrade path to Babel 6 is um, not entirely straightforward, um, it's especially if you are relying on, on things that Babel 5 uh, let you do and, and Babel 6 fixed. Um, I have something in particular in mind. Uh, so uh, what, what do you, um, like, maybe you could take a quick second to talk about some of the uh, differences in how things used to work and how they work now. Um, and maybe some of the reasoning behind some of those changes. I, we kind of touched on that a little bit, but more specifically, what are the differences between 5 and 6? Uh, I guess for one thing, um, in Babel 5, uh, stage 2 was on by default, and in Babel 6, none of the plugins are on, so you have to opt into everything. Um, but we also made the equivalent of uh, some of the options, like stage 0 by making presets. So, you know, we have the ES. 2015 preset, and you can include the stage two preset to make it similar to what it was before. Yeah, yeah I think our documentation could still use some work for helping people transition from five to six as well. There's still a lot of people that we get in our support channels just asking kind of relatively straightforward questions where it's just our documentation isn't quite up to par to help guide people. I like how we went full circle. Like the project started as five to six. And now, you know, we, we want people to upgrade from 5 to 6. <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, question, since there's a little here. Um, so the, um, the movement of Babel to uh, Babel 6 um, and the change to uh, the custom configuration. I'm curious if that had any um, movement towards or if you have anything else working on um, the notion, it's been bantered about in various discussions, but basically conditional transpilation, the idea of not transpiling everything all the time, but having some sort of way to more intelligently know whether a transpilation needs to happen, maybe based upon an environment or something. I'm curious if you could speak more to that. 
Um, so is this about like if a browser supports classes and not compiling classes? Yep, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I guess there's like nothing stopping you from doing that now. Um, kind of this is kind of related to the previous question about kind of the differences between Babel five and six. Um, so in Babel six, everything is optional. Previously in Babel five, there was kind of like this weird notion where there was stuff enabled by default, and then you could disable that depending. There's like so many different ways you could change whether a transform is actually run. There was the blacklist, so you could blacklist um, the default enabled uh, transforms from running. There was the whitelist, um, and then there was optional. So there was optional transforms that could be run, and then we had a stage option, so you could like all transforms that were met a certain stage of being enabled, so it was kind of like a spaghetti where you couldn't quite tell. It wasn't always obvious what was actually being run, what kind of transforms were being run. Um, so Babel 6, everything is very explicit. You have to specify exactly like what you want. Um, we've added uh, presets that kind of like are groups of plugins. Um, so you don't have to be to cut for like the general purposes. Um, and so I guess, yes, yeah, if you really wanted like, I don't think there's any specific in Babel that could be added to better facilitate um, custom kind of compilation for certain browsers that support certain things. There are some kind of potential issues with doing that, though. Um, you have, like, you would have just have so many different browser bundles that you'd be delivering to clients. So it'd be kind of an inconsistent environment. I guess we kind of already have this. So if you're relying on, like, certain semantics that... Babel might not compile correctly, then the native version uh, might not behave as you expect. So you've got like inconsistent environments across like different browsers, which makes debugging like a really big pain. Uh, one thing that I kind of see why you would potentially want to the the one thing that makes that uh, like the environment more co I think it justifies making that everything, the environment's more complicated would be if there were specific features that just the performance was much better um, in the native equivalent. Uh, and it'll probably most likely get to that point where like everything um, that's in ES 2015 will be uh, either the same speed or much faster than the transpiled equivalent because um, browsers will optimize them better. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's, do you have any specific things or suggestions that would make it easier to do that in Babel? There was a discussion thread that I saw at one point a while back about uh, an idea <clears throat> that I thought was being driven by the Babel team, which is why I brought it up to ask. So, so maybe it's not being driven. But there was an idea at one point that there would be a way to sort of list in your transpilation command the various browsers or versions or user agent strings that you care to support and it would sort of automatically know what it needed to transpile and not, or, or something of that nature. So I, was, I hadn't heard anything in a while about that, and I was curious if the Babel 6 had laid foundational work for that or if that was not actually an active thing. Yeah, so it's kind of going in the opposite direction from that. So that was... So, yeah, that, that was an open issue where I was kind of being, like, discussing and said how we could possibly make that work. So it was, yeah, you specify the browser you want, and it kind of got, like, the intersection of everything that was supported and excluded that. Now, that, that works when Babel had, like, an opinion on how it was actually going to compile your code. Uh, now that, like, the core of Babel, like, Babel-core is actually extremely thin, so it doesn't actually rely on any plugins. So we could potentially, like, make something like that in the core of Babel that just use core Babel plugins, but I'm not quite sure if that's... I'd, like, yeah. yeah. I'd say in Babel 6, um, because we have this kind of preset mechanism that allows you to specify sets of plugins to be enabled all at once, you could certainly have a preset that would take options for specifying a list of browsers or certain node versions um, and, you, and like have, you know, take those options and then list a set of plugins based on those options. Um, I think at this point, that's potentially just a really hard list to maintain, and uh, I don't think that that's necessarily something we'd want to maintain in the core Babel repo, but it could certainly be something that would live in, in the community uh, as, like, a separate project. Uh, right. I, I actually have a question about this. Uh, do presets currently allow options? So at the moment, uh, presets can pass options to plugins, but at the moment, presets don't have options. Um, but I, I, we do have an issue open about that, trying to decide if there's a good way to approach that. Um, I don't know. So it's not exactly possible at this moment, but 
you could still probably get it to work. Um, I also wanted to ask Sebastian, uh, he's probably sick of this question, uh, but I'm wondering uh, how do you feel about moving to Fabricator, uh, what issues you had with GitHub issues and were they solved by the move to Fabricator? Um, so I haven't actually, uh, so basically um, Babel kind of grew to the point where it was, there was like a whole lot of issues coming in. Um, there'd be like lots of them per day. Um, and so GitHub, I don't feel as if uh, it has the facilities like to handle like really large projects, at least easily. Uh, there's just like really small features like the ability to merge issues or even like uh, making users when they create an issue like specify like um, certain things so like being able to have custom fields like th there was just it got to the point where basically um, in the Babel repo we wouldn't allow uh, questions or support this is kind of like just keep everything clean would say go to Stack Overflow there's usually better Google search visibility when you post stuff to Stack Overflow and so forth um, and there was like a really big message in the readme the readme was like three lines um, nobody read the readme. Basically said, please, everyone was in bold, do not like post questions or support queries. Even in contributing.md and like a really big heading that I think may still be there, like at the top, like please do not post questions, but still people would post this stuff because um, GitHub kind of encourages this just like fire and forget mechanism, uh, which makes it really easy to report stuff, but it also makes it really hard for the, the contributors to that project to kind of like manage everything, especially when you're having like constant issues coming in especially when there's like limited amount of people uh, to kind of support all of these issues that are just flowing in. And so, yeah, it, I guess it kind of makes it sound like it was too easy to report issues, which is kind of, kind of the case. Like uh, there's been a lot of complaints where um, Fabricator makes it more difficult to report issues. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's valid since you don't even need like a GitHub account to report a Babel issue now. Uh, you like you just log in and there's literally there's like a button that says report a bug, um, and then you can like specify, like you're required to specify more information than you would have before. It's very explicit about what the issue tracker is actually for. Uh, maybe like some of the others can speak as to what their experiences have been with it, or whether like what behavior it encourages or discourages. Um, yeah, I've seen it. previously like there would be a round trip a couple of times. Someone would report an issue, and then we'd ask them, uh, "What is uh, what version of Babel are you using?" And then they'll reply, and then we'll ask them, "What uh, plugins or what presets are you using?" And then they reply, and then, "Oh, what is the input code?" And then you you'd have this issue. You, like a few days has passed, and like you really haven't done anything about it. Whereas uh, when it, with Fabricator, you know, you can add fields that say. Um, that asks the user, you know, what version of Babel are you using? What is the input code? What is the expected output? And things like that. So um, instantly, the time when you rep report an issue, we have enough context to kind of go dig in and try to solve that bug for you. Yeah, and I think just having even a small amount of friction encourages people both not necessarily to not file bugs, but to take the time to potentially do some searching and see. Uh, so, like, I would say on GitHub, we had also just a tremendous number of duplicates uh, where people would be, where they're not necessarily asking a question because they think something is a bug and then it's not, but you know because they just wanted to ask a question, they didn't necessarily stop to take the time to like do a search or see if there had been previous issues around that. Um, so you know we'd get to the point where if someone is confused about arrow functions or the behavior of this, uh, you know I think we got to the point where we probably had you know. 15 or 20 bugs around that, and Sebastian would always post like a list of 30 other duplicates, like because every time we just go find the previous one and copy paste everything. And Fabricator has you know just actual merging functionality, so if there's a duplicate, we can actually just merge it in, and that is nice. It also means that uh, if we're merging things like if something is a bug and there's duplicates, then we can merge them together, and that automatically moves subscriber lists for those bugs together into one, and just kind of helps. Everyone keep stay together, I guess, in one place. It's almost like a full feature bug tracker. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, I have a tip for uh, people uh, looking at us right now. 
which is that if you find an old bubble issue uh, link uh, that links to GitHub, and I didn't know that, is that the uh, IDs of the issues are all preserved, so you can just copy paste uh, uh, the ID of the issue at uh, fabricator.bubble.js.io uh, slash t and uh, paste that ID, and you're going to uh, see the same issue migrated from GitHub. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's unfortunate that we lost those connections when we transitioned, and I wish that there was a better way that GitHub had allowed us to do that, I guess. It's kind of issues are available or they're not, and there's very little else in between that you can do. Even be able, being able to leave the issue queue there but lock it or something like that would have been great. But So we're, we're kind of coming down on, on time with our show, um, and there were a couple other things that I wanted to ask, and um, if uh, Kyle or Pam or Dan, uh, if you have any other questions, let's try to make sure we get those in right now. But I think one thing that people will be interested in hearing about um, is what is what's the future plan for Babel? Is it going to continue to um, be like, just for JavaScript tooling uh, or, or like translation, or is it uh, like is it going to replace stuff like ESLint? Is it going to add typing? That kind of stuff. Um, what what's the future there? I, I think the move to uh, Babel six was uh, explicitly to let the community do that kind of work. Um, I think what we've seen from our usage of Babel at Facebook is that. Um, I think kind of mirrors also what the community has gone through. What we went through is that we have different teams using different parsers, uh, different JavaScript tooling, and we kind of wanted to to streamline all that and, and use the same thing. And the benefits there are obvious. One thing is that when you add a new language feature, um, all the other tools will get it for free, and you'll be able to um, work on the code base without, without errors of, like, syntax error, uh, async, uh, unexpected keyword, um, something like that. When you like add a feature like async functions, automatically everyone, all the tooling will continue to work with that with that feature. And uh, you know, we, we had different people writing different transforms, different plugins, different tools, and uh, eventually, with when we made everything into Babel, even if you wrote this one-off script, it will continue to work forever. Um, and that's the kind of thing that that we want. Um, with one of our major frustration with ESLint was like, and and Esprima was how slow they were moving. Um, every time we added a new feature, we have to go to the bug tracker and open an issue, and then talk with the with the contributors. And we also had to fork Esprima because it was very very slow moving. I think now they picked up pace again, but for a while it was it was really uh, moving slowly. And so, uh, so right now, Babel is uh, gonna give you the um, all the tools and libraries that you need to build whatever um, tool that will act on ASTs. So, for example, uh, scope tracking. Um, I remember everyone at Facebook who was writing tools had to do their own scope tracking. Had to like uh, walk the AST, look at uh, every variable. And then go and like count every a variable that referenced that variable. So you know that that's wasteful. Uh, and Babel kind of, for example, does that for you and does a, a bunch of other stuff for you. So if you want to write a linter, if you're not satisfied with the uh, with the tools out there, you can just easily you know um, npm install Babel core and start writing the 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 linter of your dreams right now. Um, and you know we have we have a few projects internally um, that we're working on on top of Babel, and hopefully we'll we'll be able to release some. Um, but I I would assume like in the future to see more more things happening in the ecosystem and the community rather than than Babel Core itself. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I think we're gonna jump to Twitter questions unless uh, one of our panelists or or any of you guests have. Uh, other things that you want to talk about before we wrap up? Uh, I wanted to ask if there are any plans for performance improvements in terms of uh, some futuristic stuff like, I don't know, transpiling just the parts that changed inside the file or something like that. Is it possible? 
I, I don't think the um, the bottleneck is the generation right now. Um, uh, I think uh, a lot of the bottleneck used to be in the uh, the passes, the the plugin pass uh, in Babel Five. Every uh, every plugin is its own pass, and that kind of like makes it really really slow. In Babel Six, uh, plugins are automatically merged. Um, actually, everything presets and plugins are automatically merged. We're thinking about uh, potentially making presets. Um, their own passes because that that's been causing some issues, uh, but I think if you switch from Babel five to Babel six, you'll see a you know a big performance boost. Um, I don't know. It, do we have anything planned, Sebastian, for any more uh, performance boosts? Um, probably. I I don't know. Nothing. I don't. Nothing in particular stands out. Um, in terms of like what we can optimize next, but I guess like we obviously like we care about performance, and if we can make it faster, then we'll try. Yeah, I know that there were a few performance improvements that we landed in Babel Five that were just general, that even weren't necessarily large architectural changes, but were just kind of optimizations. And I'm sure there's still stuff like that left in Babel Six that we can do as well. Yeah, I, I think it's already impressive where we're at now. I remember when we were switching from JS Transform, which is purely like a string-based uh, compiler. Basically, you'd walk AST and like push to a string, uh, which is very janky. Um, and um, uh, you know, there was like a lot of skepticism around: Can you actually get a compiler architecture uh, to work as fast as this string-based approach? So, a compiler architecture basically is a parser, transformer, and then generator. This is usual um, the architecture that compilers go for, and the and the skepticism was like, can you be as fast as the as the string based one? And we actually were able to hit a milestone that we were as fast as the as the string based one. So uh, maybe we're even faster at this point. Great. Great. Um, so, um, so I think we should probably jump to uh, Twitter because we're really coming down on our time, and we do have a couple of questions here that um, I think we should. Look into. Uh, Sebastian actually asked the first one. Uh, why would I use Babel over TypeScript? And I actually like maybe that was a troll question, but I actually am really interested in uh, in your thoughts. I've been really hesitant to use TypeScript, probably irrationally, um, but I really like Babel and I like the ecosystem. I like the idea of uh, of these plugins and how open it is. Um, so why uh, does anybody have thoughts on on why they would prefer to use Babel over TypeScript? I personally use TypeScript. Sweet. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I don't mean to like hate on TypeScript. I think TypeScript is very cool. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, I don't think thought? it's a fair comparison. Entirely fair comparison. Um, I, I know that the TypeScript project has been moving to kind of like um, uh, to to be uh, part of the the future of JavaScript. I suppose. So I think initially it was like more of its own thing, and which is which is cool. Yeah, I think that there's definitely like different approaches that each project has kind of taken. Um, I guess they're not like they're not like the projects aren't really synonymous. Um, there's like I've heard a lot how it's like oh Babel versus TypeScript. That's not necessarily the case. Um, I mean, is there a case where you would use Babel and TypeScript ever, or is that a false equivalency? Yeah, yeah. So like. TypeScript is actually like two things. So it's a type checker and it's a compiler. So you can just use the type checker functionality of TypeScript and just use the compiler. Um, there's like various, maybe you want to use specific Babel plugins, uh, or maybe um, Babel just has better integration into your like compiler tool chain. There's kind of like various reasons, and there's actually some people like doing that today. Uh, there's uh, like there is actually reasons why you might want to use like Babel's compiler instead of TypeScript's. Um, like TypeScript is kind of con very conservative in how it compiles the output. It takes like a few shortcuts, um, and it's in its like compilation output, so it doesn't retain the semantics of like ES twenty fifteen like as much as Babel could. Um, there's definitely like advantages between the two. Could or would you have support in Babel for the same type annotations that TypeScript does? Yeah, so Flow and TypeScript, the syntax that they have, there's like a pretty large intersection 
where yeah, flow and TypeScript syntax is basically exactly the same. So you can kind of get almost the way there. Um, there's currently not really support because there's no like large demand to add support for TypeScript syntax, like all of it into Babel. Um, potentially, like if there was, because kind of like the people who want all the TypeScript syntax will be using TypeScript. Um, so there's like yeah, there's not that much incentive to do that. Cool, makes sense. Maybe one day I'll I'll use TypeScript or Flow, but for now I think uh, I'll just um, stick to my unsafe uh, coding. <laughs> so the um, there are a couple other questions, but I think most of them are pretty much answered. One question uh, though that we have is um, Julian uh, Go. I think uh, he said I tried to switch to V6 twice, but I still have issues with async. In V5 it works. Do you think that V6 was, uh, was released too early, or maybe this is just like a specific um, problem that this user is having? Um, probably both. Like, it wasn't released too early. Um, and yeah, it's probably a specific issue. So if you actually have like a specific um, problem, then you can jump in the Slack. Um, or, but yeah, post the Slack overflow. I know there's a few people, um, like few Babel contributors that regularly kind of like check Stack Overflow and answer questions there. Um, so yeah, Babel 6 is kind of fairly rushed out or it's kind of like the bare minimum required to get it out. Um, in hindsight, that was obviously like a fairly not good idea. Um, kind of got to the point where I just got like super burnt out with working on Babel since I was kind of like working on Babel 6 mostly independently. Um, and I was like working on it for so long and like the constant having the support like Babel and everything, it kind of just like got to me and so I kind of just wanted to like push out the notes be like, there I have it, I don't really want to worry about it anymore. Um, since I didn't really want to have like this thing lingering, um, kind of like incomplete and like in a year or two having like other people piece it together. Uh, so I wanted to get to the point where, yeah, I could just push it out there. Um, yeah, so in hindsight, I definitely would have done stuff differently. Um, thankfully, I think it's like, maturing and getting stable very quickly. Um, Babel 6 probably should have been like a release candidate. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think going forward um, we're trying to encourage contribution. Um, I think uh, uh, in the past, I think uh, James Kyle have uh, tweeted like uh, and try to help people to get started with contributing to, to Babel. Uh, certainly things are getting out much better on, uh, on that front. Um, and we'll continue to do so. So, like hopefully Sebastian won't be the only one working on it and getting burnt out. Um, and uh, at least for now, we kind of have that support of the people in the uh, podcast. There are certainly still bugs, but I think it's stabilizing pretty quickly. And I think that for me especially, I've focused on making sure that the uh, ES6 functionality is as stable as possible before necessarily moving on to the more experimental stuff. Just for the sake of users not having troubles early on. Cool. Awesome. So um, I think we're, uh, we're down with our time. Let's, let's go ahead and jump into the tips and picks. Um, so I, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just go ahead and go first, and then we'll go with uh, uh, the panelists and the guests. So Sebastian, I know you kind of jumped on here last minute. If you don't have any tips and picks, that's totally fine. Um, but uh, for my tips and picks, I'm just going to say I, I'm wrapping up my current job and I'm uh, going to be working for PayPal in a week um, and I'm super excited but at one of my Christmas presents to um, my current coworkers is I built a um, I built dev tools for our app and so in development um, it checks whether you know something actually it's it's not just development it's like in production as well you can turn these dev tools on and it'll pop up this little thing at the bottom and, and you can like turn on different feature toggles and do all, all sorts of different things, like change the language and a bunch of different things. And so that's just a tip. Create uh, dev tools for your app. I wish that I'd done this six months ago so I could actually enjoy it. Um, so maybe I'll do that in my next job. And also look into loose mode um, with Babel. Um, just look into it. It may be the, a good thing for you. It may not. Um, and then for my picks, uh, I just published a blog post um, sort of about my experience up upgrading to Babel 6. It's misunderstanding ES6 modules, upgrading Babel, tiers, and a solution. So um, Logan kind of helped me with that actually a little bit. So shout out to Logan. Um, 
And then uh, clearing up the Babel 6 ecosystem is a blog post that I recommend that you check out. Um, this helped me understand what Babel is all about these days. Um, and then finally, Google Music. It's actually, I, I listen to um, uh, Pandora most of the time, but I started listening to Google Music. It's actually pretty good. So uh, check that out. Um, Kyle, do you have any tips or picks for us? Uh, I think you're muted, Kyle. Sorry about that. The first pick that I have is um, a really smart guy uh, named Wes Boss. Um, many of you probably listening have, have heard of him. He's got a fantastic um, write-up called Learn JavaScript. And in particular, he, he calls out um, a video on that site that um, I encourage all of you to go and watch. Is basically about this shift that WordPress had recently uh, moving their admin back into Node, and it was a it was a call to say, hey everybody, it's time to more deeply learn JavaScript. Um, and those that know me and listen to me at all know that resonates very closely to my heart. So, totally recommend reading that post. It's got links to a bunch of great resources, but also it was a really good video, sort of a call to arms of uh, of the the value of learning it more deeply. Uh, <clears throat> the next pick that I would have, um, sort of humorously, uh, there's a Reddit thread that went out today. Um, so those that follow Reddit or have been looking on Twitter, um, there was a marketing email about my book series and it ruffled some feathers and there was a Reddit thread um, uh, called, well, F you too, Kyle Simpson. Uh, so uh, go pile and it's in programmer humor so it's all in good fun but a lot of people seem to have taken it a bit more seriously seem to be a bit offended by <laughs> the uh, title of my book series the you don't know JS books but on that last note I said last week that the ES6 and beyond book had finally got to print and literally an hour before uh, coming on the air, this uh, copy of the book actually arrived. It is physically in print. It actually exists now, not just in uh, digital world. So uh, it's out, and the series is finally done. Uh, so there you go. Congrats. Congrats. Awesome. Cool. Um, Pam, do you have any tips or picks for us? Yeah, that's awesome, Kyle. Actually, I did get that email on one of my email accounts that Kyle sends and says, I don't know JavaScript. So I'm not surprised that a thread came of that. That's pretty funny. Um, so uh, my tip that uh, is we're getting towards the last week of the year. So um, a few friends of mine have been, people are starting to put together their year in review things. Um, and so I, I might encourage everyone to, to think about what they've done this year. And it's a good time to do that. Um, and then also in the spirit of the holiday this week, uh, my pick is, uh, you still have a few days to do some of it, and I mean, maybe this will stay up after after the Christmas holiday, but Advent of Code uh, is a nice uh, little project with um, with projects each day. Of, so an Advent calendar is related to the days leading up to Christmas. So it gives you uh, some, some things to do. So you can uh, practice writing some, some simple problems just for fun. So especially if you have some downtime, it might be fun to check out. Great. Dan, what do you have? Yeah, uh, I, my pick today is a blog post uh, by, uh, I hope I get the, his surname correct, uh, Axel uh, Rochmeyer. Uh, so um, this blog is uh, on tuality.com. Uh, this is a blog post about using a Webpack 2, which is currently in beta, uh, together with Babel 6 uh, to get uh, what some call uh, dead code elimination, some call uh, tree shaking, and some people say that it's silly to compare them or whatever. But anyway, it's supposed about how to uh, use ES6 imports and exports uh, to kind of get rid of the parts uh, of the libraries uh, that you don't use. And of course, it only works when they're written in ES6. But this is something to um, a, a nice uh, post to take a look to and to take into account. So check it out. Cool. Um, all right. So let's go to our guest, um, Amjad. You want to give us a start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, okay. So fix. I read recently. I read this. Uh, actually, let me start with Emacs. Um, 
uh, about a year ago, I decided to... I, I've been, like, using all sorts of uh, editors and never been satisfied with any one of them. Um, and I tried to um, use something that is... Uh, that is not your your typical GUI editor. Uh, so I, I started with with Vim, and I kind of like spent two months struggling and really unproductive. But then moved to Emacs, and uh, I think I really like the Emacs experience. Now I feel like I'm really a lot more productive than I than I used to be with the GUI editors. So I would say kind of like take the time to to learn a uh, um, six year old editor like Emacs or Vim, um, and um, the other one is uh, is a book uh, by uh, Nassim Nicholas Talib. It's called Anti Fragile. Um, I think it's one of those books that kind of like changed my thinking about the world, and I really recommend it for uh, for people. Uh, I first heard of it uh, in an internal talk by John Carmack, and he was talking about ideas and how he gets ideas and how he tests them, and he introduced this concept that uh, some things benefit from from stress. From shock and from randomness, and he he talked about the process of of uh, coming up with ideas as as something like that. So I definitely recommend checking out this book. And finally, a uh, project that I had uh, for a couple few years now, but more recently I picked up the work on it. It's called uh, Repl.it, and I kind of want to plug it because um, I recently added uh, Node.js, so you can like. Uh, it's basically a REPL in the browser, so you can execute code uh, in, the in, the, in your browser, and you can share the code, you can save it. Um, and uh, I, we originally used uh, Tracer for ES uh, 2015, uh, and ironically, we still do that, but uh, I just have a diff out to uh, change it to Babel. So check it out, repl.it. Cool. Yeah, I was just looking at it. It looks pretty cool. Sebastian, do you have any uh, tips or picks for us? Um, I don't have anything, but I'm going to give a shout-out to our Sainsbury's chocolate-flavored British 1% fat milk. Pick it up from your local Sainsbury's today for only one pound. Oh, man. That, yeah. It's good. See you there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. That'll definitely go on the website for sure. <laughs> Logan, uh, what do you have for us? Um, I don't think I have a ton in the way of... Uh, tips or picks, but I would say that, uh, you know, if you're interested in just chatting about uh, ES6 or JavaScript or have any questions, please make sure to come hang out with us on Slack. Uh, there's tons of people that just hang out and chat about JavaScript and ask questions about Babel and everything, so, you know, it's a fun little community. <laughs> cool. We'll add a link to that in the show notes so people can get to the Slack. Um, and awesome. Henry, what do you have? Uh, my pick is uh, AST Explorer uh, by Felix Kling. Um, it's a really cool uh, website you can use and helps you visualize uh, code that you can paste in to see, uh, learn more about ASTs. Uh, and also has a lot of awesome features like being able to live develop Babel plugins. Um, so yeah, shout out for that. Cool. All right. Um, I think that's it. So we'll wrap things up. Thanks, everybody, for coming to the show, um, especially Sebastian for jumping in last minute. Um, that was kind of a fun little surprise. Um, just to, to close things up, um, if you have any suggestions for shows or guests that you'd like to uh, see on the show, go to suggest.javascriptjabber, or javascriptjabber, gosh. There, that's an awesome podcast you should check out. But <laughs> it's uh, suggest.javascriptair.com. Um, and then uh, if you have any feedback for us on this episode or the show in general, go to feedback.javascriptair.com. And then uh, remember, next week's episode is with uh, Dan Abramoff and Brian Lunsdorf about functional and immutable uh, design patterns in JavaScript. Should be a very interesting episode. And then, as always, follow us on Twitter and Google+, and Facebook for the latest. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you uh, coming on, and we'll see everybody next week. Bye-bye.